lecture on cardio fears. It's pretty high yield stuff. So um, I'll listen in. <laughs> so we're just going to go um, over a general overview of the cardiovascular system. We'll go through excitation of the heart, cardiac cycle, cardiac output, circulation, and we'll likely touch on blood pressure. So basically the cardiovascular system consists of a pulmonary circulation and a systemic circulation. Something you should remember is the pulmonary circulation is of lower pressure and the systemic is of higher pressure. Um, also a question that commonly comes up, um, just know that the same volume of blood that flows in the systemic circulation per minute is the same as the pulmonary circulation, which makes sense if you think about it to keep the system flowing well. Yeah, and so you can calculate flow by having the change of pressure over the resistance. And you can use that picture on the top right to um, see the difference. And obviously, laminar flow is <coughs> the healthy flow, and that's what you want. Um, and turbulent flow can cause complications. So there's a couple more definitions there on the bottom. So laminar flow is where your velocity is the highest in the centre of the tube, um, and that would decrease closer to the vessel wall. And your turbulent flow, if vessels branch and become constricted, they're going to... Um, have more resistance and have some more complications. And that can be like um, through plaque buildup or atherosclerosis building up as well. And you can hear that. Um, so when you do your cardio OSCE and they ask you, was it a brewery? I'm going to tell all of them and see how, see what they make that. Yep. Um, so pressure is force over area. Um, I think you all know it flows down a concentration gradient and that's created by the pumping action of the heart. Just know that it's not the absolute pressures, but it's the pressure differences between the ends of the tubes that causes flow. Um, and as pressure difference increases, flow increases linearly, which makes sense. And there's a bit about valvular pressure systems um, and when they're open and closed, um, just in terms of pressure there. And in regards to resistance, um, probably the biggest thing you need to take out of this slide, I'll go through it again, but is radius has the biggest effect on resistance. So for those who are math minded, you can look at that equation at the top. Um, you see radius is to the power of four. So any changes to the radius is going to significantly <coughs> significantly affect that um, equation. Um, how do you pronounce that law? I don't really know. Yeah, it's like four, you four don't Joule's know law, that. you'll remember. So yeah, so it's inversely related to flow um, and it's how hard it is for blood to get from one place to the other. So this is probably a common exam question. Um, saying, you know, if I change the length or the uh, radius of the vessel, um, what will affect the flow the most? It's always the radius. So compliance um, is the change in volume over change in pressure. Um, basically, just understand that it's how easily a chamber um, or blood vessel will expand when it's filled with a volume, volume of blood. So basically, something that's compliant is stretchy. Um, know that your veins are very compliant and your arteries are not. Um, and the stressing volume on the graph here, that is um, the only part used to calculate compliance. So then excitation of the heart, this is pretty important just to know um, how the electrical activity spreads. So first you've got that action potential generated at the SA node, and that's via pacemaker cells. We'll go through pacemaker action potentials soon. So that wave of excitation spread through the internodal pathways to the AV node, know that there's slower conduction here, um, and that's to allow for adequate filling times. That's a bit of a common question you can get. Um, and then it goes to the bundle of hairs and the Purkinje fibres to allow for contraction. Um, and in the heart, you would have studied two types of cardiac action potentials. So first you have your ventricular um, potentials, and they're in the cardiac monocytes, so within the heart. And then you also have your pacemaker um, action potentials. Um, and the pacemaker ones we'll talk about a bit in a minute, but they're the, um, <coughs> like the, the rhythm that the heart sets itself. So the heart can actually beat in isolation. Um, and we'll talk about how that happens in a minute. And there's some quick summary notes that you can note down about some of the action potentials there. That's a really good Khan Academy video, because I love Khan Academy. Um, ventricular action potentials. So that's just a summary there. I would know that the difference between um, cardiac and skeletal action potentials is that plateau phase, which we'll go through in a bit more detail as well. Um, this is a really good summary. I would learn this, um, very helpful. And yeah, the next few slides pretty much is gonna go through that, but that diagram basically sums it up really well. So basically you've got the rapid upstroke and depolarization. It's all about the fast voltage gated sodium channels and an influx of sodium. 
then you've got the initial repolarization. So basically there's these transient potassium channels and they start to open. There's an efflux of potassium that leads to this really small initial repolarization. Then you've got the plateau. This is the really important part. So at the same time as the potassium efflux, there um, is slow latent voltage gated um, calcium channels that open leading to a calcium influx. Um, and you can kind of imagine them working against each other, creating this plateau. Um, and that prolongs the action potential to allow um, for the heart muscle to perform. And then you've got rapid repolarization and the return to resting membrane potential. So basically voltage gated calcium channels close um, and then the voltage gated potassium channels dominate. Um, so moving away from that plateau and basically just brings the membrane potential back down. So a bit more about pacemaker action potentials. There's a lot of writing on here and I'm probably gonna read off it. So you've got spontaneous action potentials occur within pacemaker cells in the uh, SA node, AV node, and the Pikinji fibers. Um, and we'll, there's a good diagram coming up soon about a train and how that all kind of, you know, you know correlates there. And then your resting, member, <laughs> resting membrane potential of nodule tissue is more positive than the cardiac muscle fibers, but it's not stable. So. How this kind of happens is at first you have a slow influx of sodium into the, uh, into the cell. Um, membrane is leaky to the sodium, um, but the sodium funny or slow channels. Um, I don't know why they're called funny channels, but that's cool. Um, and the first phase is you get rapid depolarization. So as the sodium kind of comes in, um, slowly comes in, it gets to a threshold. Um, and then we get a massive um, cal calcium influx uh, causing rapid depolarization. Um, due to the transient uh, channels opening briefly. Um, so the latent channels open for a sustained period. Um, when that happens, you, you'll see it on the graph, but at the peak, we get repolarization. So potassium channels then open, allowing potassium to leave the cell. The calcium channels and the sodium channels close, causing repolarization of the membrane, returning it to its negative value. Um, and then you kind of get slow depolarization of phase four, and this is the like cycle starting again. And that's why the pacemaker sets its own current. So this can go on and on and on. So the heart can be in isolation without the body, which is pretty cool. Um, this is a really good diagram, just kind of going over what we just said. Um, so basically this is also good. The pacemaker versus the ventricular action potentials. Um, that's just a bit of a summary about it, which is pretty interesting. Um, so this is really important. The normal pacemaking rates of each of the nodal tissues um, so the SA node, that is what sets the heart rate in a normal healthy person because its pacemaker cells have the fastest spontaneous rate of firing, um, so that creates our sinus rhythm. However, if this SA node is damaged, um, you will then, the AV node will take over as setting the rate, so it will be a lower heart rate, and then if the AV node is damaged, the Purkinje fibres take over. So really know these rates because if a person comes in with, I don't know, damage from a myocardial infarction and their heart rate is a lot lower, that will help you work out where the problem is. So yeah, so overall there's autonomic control of the heart. So with its own intrinsic uh, rhythm, which is about 100 beats per minute, um, autonomic nerves will only modulate the rate of excitation. So we can conclude that as normal heart rate is around 70 beats per minute, the heart has an overall parasympathetic tone. So to kind of think about that is overall, the heart is parasympathetic. Um, that's its tone, it will be low. So the heart itself has to maintain that fast rhythm. And I would just remember that there's no parasympathetic innovation to the ventricles. So it can't change the force of contraction, but it can change the rate. So you can see the rate changing here, but the force of contraction doesn't change. Okay, that's really important. This table is a really good summary of that as well. Yeah, so um, and cardiac contraction involves a shortening of uh, sarcomeres, cross bridges, cycling, and excitation, and contraction coupling. So very similar to um, all you probably know about muscles and skeletal muscles. However, they are different. Um, so in cardiac muscle contractions, there's no tetanic <coughs> say yeah. contractions. So the refractory period is created by a plateau phase, ensuring only one action potential can occur at once, allowing for ventricles to fill with blood. And that kind of makes sense in order to get blood from one place in the heart to out in a nice, succinct manner. Um, and calcium induced calcium release, uh, so the process in which calcium is released during cardiac action potential causes the re release of calcium required for contraction. We'll go over that in a little bit, that's pretty important. Um, so in the heart, what's really important is excitation contraction coupling. 
Um, this is a pretty long slide, but it's really important. I would recommend um, just writing it out a few times so you can remember it, because um, it's how the heart contracts. So basically, the action potential will trigger depolarization of the cell membrane. This opens latent type calcium channels, which contribute to the action potential and binds to intracellular reanidine receptors on the surface of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This triggers the opening of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and releases internal calcium stores. Okay, so you've got calcium causing calcium release. That's what the calcium induced calcium release is, and that's really important for the contraction. So then this will raise the intracellular calcium, um, allowing for that cross bridge cycling um, that is really important in muscle contraction. Um, the calcium will then bind to troponin C, remove tropomyosin from the binding site on actin, and allow for the cross bridge to occur and eventually muscle contraction. Um, so basically, this external supply of calcium is cut off and that stops the contraction because you've got the calcium ATPase pump pumping the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and into the T-tubule um, and then the potassium efflux as always for repolarization. So that's pretty important. And I know maybe just go back, oh you can leave it on this slide. <coughs> but a lot of that's a lot of information and you're probably be sitting in your exam and it's hard to recall all that at once. So a tip is just to kind of draw out more of a simple diagram and you can see how this diagram is used less words and kind of get it visualised in your head. So then when you're in the exam, you can just go, okay, calcium channels open, blah, blah, blah. This leads to that, which leads to that, which leads to that. This is yep. a little pack. And just remember that calcium-induced calcium release from the cytoplasm reticulum there. Yep. Um, sorry, someone online was asking um, whether the coupling in cardiac myocytes is different to what you just what you'd see in skeletal muscle. Yes, it is different. So in skeletal muscle, you don't have um, that calcium-induced calcium release. Yep. Um, and also, yeah, that's the main thing I would mm -hmm. say. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so some more equations here. Cardiac output, um, which is stroke volume times heart rate. So that can make sense when you look at it like that. Um, so it means when you change cardiac output, it means you've either changed your stroke volume or your heart rate. Um, and it means that your stroke volume, I'm pretty sure, is a maximum. So the only way you can increase and decrease it is through your heart rate. Yeah, um, yeah. That's kind of like a bit of like the HLP. If you did that, you kind of understand that. Um, so changing stroke volume, the important things to remember is you can change muscle length to change stroke volume or you can change calcium release to increase the strength of the contraction there. Good diagram here. This is a little bit on preload and afterload. I'll kind of leave that there and explain it. It's pretty self-explanatory, but it's a few terms that come up pretty often. So the Frank Starling mechanism, this probably come back to haunt you. Um, so I'll go through it. The tension developed in a muscle fiber depends on the extent to which the fiber is stretched. So basically you have um, an optimal length of the sarcomere um, from which the most forceful contractions occur. Um, so when an increased, it's a bit of a flow chart, so think of it like that. So when an increased volume of blood flows into the heart, the walls of the heart stretch, increasing the length of the sarcomeres, increasing cross bridge formation and the force of contraction, increasing stroke volume, okay? So that increased end diastolic volume, which is involved in the stroke volume equation, um, increases the ventricular pressure, which increases the stretch, um, allowing for the more cross bridges to form and a more forceful contraction. So that all does make sense. It's just you need to kind of get that flow chart in your head to work it out. And I think this is the right analogy, but if you think about a balloon, you blow it up a little bit and you let it go, it'll only travel a little bit. But if you blow it up massively and you let it go, it'll go all around yeah, the room. So that's it. That's the but if you blow it up too much, it'll pop. So... There's like about that perfect sarcomere so. length. <laughs> so yeah, so you've got autonomic matching, which is another thing. Um, this is on the right and left sides of the heart, and it occurs to prevent pulmonary congestion. So you get an increase in the right ventricle cardiac output, which results in an increased volume in the pulmonary system, and the pulmonary system is the lungs. Um, increased pressure in the pulmonary veins, and then we get increased volume in the left ventricle, and then an increased left ventricle cardiac output. So it kind of makes sense in terms of the more you're shoving in one end, it's going to be pretty even, and the more you're going to, the same, sorry, you're going to get out the other end. Just keep that good flow. Um, cardiac cycle, this diagram is really good to get your head around. Um, basically, if you can get your head around that, you've pretty much nailed the cardiac cycle. Here's all the phases. I won't read them out because it's a little bit boring. 
always something you've just got to visualise in your head. And yeah. I found ECG is really confusing in first year and I'm still kind of studying it in second year. So if you don't get it immediately, if you just kind of get a visualise of that thing, don't stress too much. Um, that's probably the important aspect. Definitely. So just work out what all happens together so you can understand it as a whole. Um, so venous return. Um, venous pressure is the driving force of filling the heart and is affected by peripheral resistance and cardiac output. Um, so basically, Chris Wright will talk to you about this a bit more, but cardiac output will equal venous return um, and venous return is affected by venous pressure as well. Yeah, so there are a couple of different little thingy jigs, mm -hmm. what are they called again? Acronyms? Yeah, that you should probably know. Chris Wright will go through this really, really well. I think I'll leave it up to him just because he's better at it. And Chris um, Wright's a really good resource to use. His door's always open. I know he says it, but I know certainly I did and a lot of my mates used him. And he'll literally help you a lot. So um, some quite complex things. Cool. Yeah, Especially if you did further math like myself mm -hmm. and you're not that good at math. <laughs> So arteries, so the role is to allow blood to be uh, continuously flowed throughout the heart um, during uh, systole, about two thirds of the blood flowing through the arteries is actually used to stretch the wall and the remaining third uh, participates in actual blood flow. So during diastole, uh, when there's no more blood entering, the elastic walls collapse and the blood being used to hold them open uh, participates in blood flow. So it's to try and keep it open as well to increase the pressure, because you can imagine like a tube and if it collapses on itself, it's not that good. Yeah. Um, and then the arterioles uh, control resistance by increasing their diameter. And as we said before, <coughs> diameter has the biggest effect on resistance. So you can imagine, I mean, when you start exercising, your arterioles uh, might increase their diameter to allow more uh, muscles to, skeletal muscles to run. This is a good thing on the effect as well, down there. Um, basically, everyone knows what the capillaries do. Don't think we need to go through that. Um, Starling's forces, these will definitely come back to haunt you. I would know these because it comes back in renal as well. Um, internal hydrostatic pressure, that's the pressure exerted by the fluid inside the capillaries. So it's aiming to push the fluid out of the capillaries. External hydrostatic pressure exerted by the fluid in the interstitium and it wants to push fluid in. Internal oncotic is about the proteins in the plasma. Um, it wants to suck the fluid into the capillaries and then external oncotic um, wants to suck. Oh, that's wrong. I'll fix that. Um, so basically a common question you get is pressures that favour filtration. This is more renal, but anyway. Internal hydrostatic and external oncotic and pressures that oppose filtration is external hydrostatic and internal oncotic. So veins, they provide a low resistance pathway for blood back to the heart due to their high compliance because they're super stretchy. Arteries versus veins, know this. Um, just little questions that I could ask about it. Cardiac function to curve, Chris Wright goes through this so much. Um, so there's the cardiac function part, um, which shows the relationship between cardiac output and end diastolic volume. Just remember end diastolic volume, if that increases, stroke volume increases, and so your cardiac output does. Um, and then the vascular function curve <coughs> shows the relationship between venous return and right atrial pressure. Um, this is really important, but Chris Wright will go through it. Um, there are, they are, does not necessarily mean you'll have an increase in blood flow um, and the way that your body does this is through auto regulation um, and you can imagine if you increase your blood pressure uh, your arteries will dilate a bit more which allows blood flow to occur and vice versa um, so, so yeah so there's an auto regulation constantly happening in your body which makes sense um, but yeah just know that I think we're going to talk a bit more about how we control that so uh, it is achieved by rapid changes in flow by local vasodilation and constriction, as I just talked about. So this happens by baroreceptors, and they're located in the carotid sinus um, and the aortic arch. So when there's high blood pressure, we're increasing the vessel wall, stretching it out. This then increases baroreceptor firing, so it's signaling. Uh, these signals then go up to the brain, in the medulla and in medulla, sorry, and inhibit the vasoconstriction sound. Um, and excite the vagal parasympathetic, no, 
Excite the vagal parasympathetic center, resulting in increased vasodilation um, to decrease the heart rate. And so we won't do that yet, we'll do this one. So the baroreceptor reflex, this is about the head up tilt. I'm not sure if you've done the experiment yet, but it's used to restore mean arterial pressure in the event of sudden disturbance. So basically when the head up tilt happens, there's a reduction in central blood volume because it all goes to the peripheries, leading to a decreased venous return and cardiac output. Um, this causes the arterial pressure to decrease, causing a decreased rate of firing. So basically, if you ever get asked a question about this, know the four ways that the body will respond and then summarise it um, using this sentence at the bottom just to put it all together. So basically, the body will respond by decreasing parasympathetic nervous system stimulation to the heart. So that will increase heart rate and cardiac output. Um, increases sympathetic nervous system stimulation to the heart, increasing heart rate, stroke volume, and cardiac output. Increasing sympathetic nervous system stimulation to the veins, the veins constrict, increase venous pressure and increase venous return, increasing end diastolic volume, increasing stroke volume, and thus cardiac output, and then increasing sympathetic stimulation to arterioles, constricting them and increasing the total peripheral resistance. So these all work together um, to increase the mean arterial pressure towards normal. Um, just these are the equations you should also remember. Questions? All right, so um, I probably should have put a picture up of the P wave, but the P wave is the first little segment on um, the ECG. So, what does the P wave on the ECG represent? So, you've got ABCD, atrial repolarization, atrial depolarization, ventricular repolarization, not ventricular depolarization. For those playing at home, I'll give you a couple, <laughs> couple seconds. Wish we had some game show music. There you go, yes. So yeah, that's atrial depolarization. So that picture just shows um, the P wave, uh, which is in the second half um, issue there, which is when the atrium becomes depolarized. Um, and you just go back. So yeah, and you can just kind of learn off that picture um, and you can see what's happening within the heart contraction. So old mate has an acute myocardial infarction, which results in uh, their SA node being destroyed. Very unlucky. So what would you estimate their pacemaker firing rate to be? So let them think it home for a little bit. Let's keep going. <laughs> All right, so, um, so what happens there? So you knock out your pacemaker, uh, the SA node, uh, which is about the 70 to 80 beats per minute then. So then according to the train, um, you kind of cut off that first carriage and then the second carriage is left to be born uh, the rest of the load, which is about 40 to 60. Then old mate's brother has an acute myocardial infarction as well, which results in their AV node being destroyed. So the AV node this time. Um, and now what would you estimate their pacemaker firing rate to be? Um, so a bit of a different question. So bang. So um, yeah, so you take that off. Um, obviously the SA node can't, even though that's not destroyed, when it goes through the um, AV nodes being blocked. Um, so you get more P waves, but fewer QRS complexes. Um, and you'll study that in your life when you start this heart block. All right. What phase of the cardiac cycle is the following? So what phase are we looking at uh, when this happens? When ventricular pressure is greater than the pressure behind the aortic valve, blood is ejected from the ventricle into the aorta. Following this, pressure begins to fall and ventricle begins to relax. This is seen on the T wave of the ECG. That's all about knowing that, oh, knowing that diagram about the cardiac cycle. So how we think. So it's a pretty niche question that would be pretty stiff on an exam, but I think if you know kind of these things, um, it will help answer all questions related to this. Just knowing how to put it together. So that's great. And I should probably just on your slides, just go back and have a look at that other picture. Yeah. Put up. Which of the following will see the greatest increase in resistance? We talked about this. I hope you all know that it is halving the radius. Which of the following statements is correct? Okay. Blood flowing in all veins of the body has the low oxygen content. You know that that's wrong. Pulmonary veins and umbilical veins. Um, the total resistance of the pulmonary circulation is much less than that of the systemic. Maybe. The volume of blood flowing into the aorta per minute is much larger than that into the pulmonary artery per minute. That's not true. Flow is the same at um, all points. 
and then the renin angiotensin system is involved in the acute control of blood blood pressure, it's actually long term. So the answer is B. Cardiac output would be decreased by which of the following? Okay, decreased activation of sympathetic nerves innervating the ventricles, increased activation of sympathetic nerves innervating the arterioles. So we know this, that would actually increase it. Increased activation of sympathetic nerves innervating the veins, that would also increase it by increasing venous return. Um, decreased activation of parasympathetic nerves innervating the SA node, that would increase it as well. So the answer is A. And that is it. So thank you all for listening. Hmm. Um, thank you so much, guys. Um, that, that will be the last in-semester revision lecture for now. Um, thank you all for a great semester. Best luck for your exams. If you guys have any questions, um, feel free to let either George or Monk, you know, or myself as well, and I'll be sure to send, them, send you their way. Um, yeah, and again, thank you so much. And this video will be up on YouTube later if you want to rewatch it or go through some questions again.